plugin of the week is the Universal Audio Studer A800. Uh, the Studer A800 uh, was originally designed by Will Studer. Um, Will Studer goes all the way back to Abbey Road Studios in EMI. Uh, he made uh, one of the most famous tape machines out of that studio, the J37, and uh, which was used on Beatles records and other countless classics. Uh, Will went on to make um, a lot of amazing analog tape machines, and uh, one of the most amazing ones that he created was the Studer A800. It came out in 1978. Uh, what was really unique about it is that the transport was microprocessor controlled. So we actually had a microprocessor managing the tape speed and, uh, and uh, the movement of the tape. And so what he did is he made something that was incredibly accurate with a minimum of wow and flutter and uh, those types of things. Um, sonically, just incredible sounding. Now, the original unit, the 24-channel uh, the um, uh, multi-track tape machine, could actually be used. What was really cool about it is that you could actually swap out head stacks. So it was as a 2-inch machine, you could put in a 16-track or an 8-track head stack, and it would just use the electronics of the first 8, 16, or all 24 channels, depending upon the head stack that you had. And each one would have a different level of quality. So the 8-track head stack sounded the best. It sounded incredible. In fact, it was used quite a lot in movies and film as a way for, because uh, it also had a time code track for synchronization. Um, and it was basically like uh, final mix quality audio on all eight tracks, uh, which is really cool. Um, the multi-track itself, itself just sounds ridiculous. And uh, it's also a very heavy machine. The original machine weighed like 900 pounds. So if, uh, if you're on uh, like the rest of the world, other than the United States, it's about 408 kilograms. So a pretty pretty damn heavy machine. It wasn't the type of thing that you kind of would carry up a flight of stairs uh, if you had a choice about it. And uh, it's a pretty, pretty cool sounding machine. So let's take a listen and kind of start off a little bit with it. Now, when you actually open up, uh, uh, set up the machine, there's actually an open close thing. So you can look at the reels as they go by. Uh, it will give you the tape formulation that you have selected, which you can select from here. Um, basically, there were two versions. There was a uh, two sets of circuits. It was an NEB circuit and an CCIR circuit. So this was a European equalization curve, which was slightly different from the NEB um, curve. Uh, and so this was playback equalization compensation um, that was built into the electronics of the tape machine. And so this would work at 15 and 7.5, and but if you switch to 30 inches per second, that disappears because it was only uh, basically an NEB equalization. So uh, the earlier uh, standards for 15 and 7.5 and would have these two separate standards. Um, you could turn off the noise uh, independently. This is just tape hiss, which you could, you know, leave on. If you want to do in pure multi-track style, you can leave the controls ganged. And, and when you turn this on, what ends up happening is, is that if I just start spreading this around uh, to multiple tracks here, oops, all right, kind of go from there. All right, so it looks like I have a whole bunch of mono tracks. So these are all primarily percussion instruments, and we're going to hear what this sounds like. Um, okay, let's get past these, some of the error messages here and uh, work with that. Um, uh, so I have some mono and some stereo tracks here. So what I'm doing is I'm just going to copy and paste this across to a whole number of these guys right across to here. And then I think we'll be pretty good. So we'll just get the stereo tracks on them here. And uh, so depending upon, you know, uh, it's not the... Uh, um, it actually is fairly easy if you have a universal audio uh, setup and it's, it's not one that is overly, um, uh, takes up too much in terms of the processing load, but I'm just gonna set up another machine here just so we can see, uh, so that you can see that they all change kind of in, uh, in tandem together. This is gonna show the kick drum levels here on the meter, and we also have input and output gain stages, although we're gonna kind of leave it alone just here. Now we can actually monitor the sync head or the repro head, which uh, the sync head is the actual record head. Um, and the way that that works is that when you were overdubbing, you could record, you would have to uh, play back from the record head or the same head that you were recording to. Otherwise, you would not have synchronous recording. So uh, this was something that was um, an adaptation created by Les Paul. Some people uh, say that he was the father of, of uh, this, and he wasn't. He created a selective uh, reproduce, the ability to play back on a record head. Um, 
tracks. So he didn't invent multi-track recording, which is a very different thing. But as I switch things here, you'll notice that they switch on both machines, and that was kind of the idea here. But what we can do is we can work with different tape formulations, Scotch 250, uh, Ampex 250, uh, 456, or GP9, and then, or which quantity GP9 at that later point, and then uh, the 900 tape, which was originally a BASF tape, and I think it was re-released by RMG, so I'm not sure exactly what they used. There's also different calibration standards that would give you uh, different amounts of compression. So if I go to a plus three alignment, I will get less tape compression, more compression here at plus nine. And so you could hear that openness. So like if I actually take this and turn it off, that's unprocessed. Seven and a half, what, what happened, what's interesting when you get to the different um, uh, tape speeds is that the slower the tape, the tape speed, the less high frequency response you generally get and the more uh, low frequency response that you get. Now, it's a little bit deceptive because um, the way that the play playback equalization curves works, there's a maximum frequency that it sort of peaks out at. And this ends up being at, at seven and a half on a Studer tape machine, somewhere in the 16, 17K range, where it kind of gives a little peak there before dropping off very rapidly. So it almost will sound like there's more top end when there actually isn't. Interestingly, the 30 inches per second has more low frequency, and this probably has to do with just the calibration of the particular machine they were working on. So if I do this right, I should be able to... I'm going to stage this back a little bit so overall we're hitting the tape less hard, and I'll make up for this on the output stage. Now I can I could focus if I just like see which one I like best. Now that actually has it has a little bit to me too much uh, buildup of the low frequencies, but let's just kind of see what this sounds like if I switch to different tape formulations. more pronounced than the 456. You can hear the more headroom of the GP9. These two um, are able to handle plus nine. That was they were what they were designed for. So the first two tapes were originally designed for plus three or plus six alignments, which would be heavy compression for those two tape formulations. And then the 900 and GP9 were more set up or calibrated to have higher, um, you know, in order to get uh, more tape compression, you would need to go up to plus nine. And so you can hear as we crank in this, you get more of that low end buildup. Or focus on it. Not as much variation with that. Let's go to the GP9. So far, out of all of these, I kind of like this, this setup here. The 250 is actually not bad at plus three. You can really hear how that overdrives at 456. That or that. Kind of like the 250 has a bit more character, a bit more of an edgy kind of quality. And what you're really doing is you're listening for the subtlety of this. Uh, you notice when I put this in, uh, this is something that you could put in as the lead plugin. One of the things you do need to be concerned about is the audio levels coming in. So, in other words, if if I were to take this and actually tone this back overall, set the overall input and output levels, um, because of the record levels being too high, I want to be very conscious of that. 
because that will affect how much this compresses. So you can actually control quite a lot of the compression by setting the input and output gain stages. Uh, this is very important because analog levels are, are registered in a very different way um, than our digital levels. And so on an analog tape machine on a view meter, you're not seeing peaks. You see this, this level meter go up to zero and you think that's right, but that's more of an average level. And on something that has a, a very sharp transient and not a lot of sustain, um, uh, you're, you put it up to zero and you could be overdriving that track by 20 dB on peak level, 30 dB a peak level. So uh, some of the machines, well, these machines would have uh, peak LEDs that were kind of built in so that you could see that type of thing. But a very, very cool machine. When you really get into it, if you were, um, if you were really into the, um, uh, the tape machine electronics themselves, you also notice that there's all kinds of calibrations here. So when you set up with the AutoCal, then it will work with the calibration settings based on the setup for this particular machine and all of um, uh, as it would be normally calibrated. But you can go in and then you can make adjustments to mess with it separately. So if you switch the auto cal off, then you can go in and you can work with the reprodu uh, reproduction EQ. And this would add more high frequency energy in or more low frequency energy in. or take away low frequency energy. And if you have the noise, you can balance out the amount of, of hum and hiss. And so, and you could also um, adjust the, um, the bias settings. This is for the sync EQ, so if you're working on the sync head, you'll notice that the high frequency response suffers more dramatically. This is because in, in the actual design of the head, the gap, uh, which determines the frequency response on the record side, it being wider allows the magnetic field strength to be higher. Um, and you still get the same frequency response on the record. On the playback though, um, you want the optimization for the playback quality and the high frequency, so the head gap is narrower. So you literally uh, lose um, you know, high frequency response when you play back through the sync head. This is something that was understood while you were overdubbing. And then when you switch to the repro head to burn your rough mix or whatever, it would be actually cool. There's also a through, which allows you to also go through the electronics, but without going through the tape. So you'd be passing through the transformers and other electronics that were part of the tape machine. So you can work with those individual elements as well. Um, very, very cool. <laughs> you can have a lot of fun with this. There's actually quite a lot of variation when you really get into it. Normally, the way these things would be set up in the in the real analog realm is that you would calibrate the machine based off the tape that you wanted, the tape speed, and what you felt was the best setup for the particular project you were recording on. And the whole calibration process for a tape machine, full calibration process for a single tape machine might take an hour. Um, it was somebody who does it really, really well and has done it many times, maybe 40 minutes or 45 minutes per machine. So if you're running 48 track, that would be two separate tape machines. It would take two hours just to set up the tape machine and calibrate everything with all the bias and um, uh, level adjustments and frequency balancing on a per channel basis. So there's quite a big setup, a whole lot easier here when you set it up. Um, and once you set up the gang controls and you get the basic vibe, you can go through tracks one by one and make subtle adjustments or major adjustments if that's what you feel is necessary. And you can kind of play with it. But uh, um, a very cool one. Let me, let me just uh, do a quick uh, AB with and without it. So there's no real makeup gain per se built in here. I'll try to compensate for it here. But you can really feel the depth and openness to that kind of add in, and that's the classic sound of the uh, of the Studer A800 tape machine. Cool plugin, love this one. Uh, one of my favorites for the multi-track end and the ATR102, which I've already done a video on, is also an amazing one for the uh, two-track end, for the mix bus end. Nice combination to have, uh, one of my favorites. So uh, there we have it, Universal Audio, um, Studer A800 uh, tape emulation.